Okay, hi everyone. So I'm SmithyQ, and we're back now with the next installment of our series on opening principles and opening traps. We're going to continue our look with the fried liver variations. But before we do that, let's just do a quick reminder of this position. We covered it earlier, uh, the Blackbird Shilling Gambit. It's a bad move. It's black playing for tricks. Let's just, why does this work? It works for two reasons. One, it tempts white to be greedy and you know, greed very rarely pays off in chess. But two, more fundamentally, there's a lot of weaknesses in white's position. I know that sounds odd, it's only been three moves and they're all standard, but if you were to look at the undefended pieces, we've got a bishop, we've got this pawn, we've got this pawn, uh, we've got that rook, none of them are defended. And after knight takes e5, even the knight's undefended. And unfortunately for white, queen goes to g5, hits the knight, hits the pawn, um, all these weaknesses are coming to four, and we've got this very standard checkmating attack coming up. Why'd it work? Because there's a lot of tactical weaknesses, and white got greedy. So, with that in mind, let's look at this position. White's attacking f7. Last time we looked at some interesting ideas with knight takes e4. But let's look at d5, definitely the main move. We blunt f7. And now here, knight d4 now. Now before we go further, I just want to clarify. This is a interesting move. It's probably not the best move, but it's a good move. It's a fine move. Why is this a good move here, whereas this on move three is just hope chess and playing for tricks? Because it's important to understand that. And I think if after just flipping through this a few times, is that we can kind of see the differences. Uh, here, black has one piece developed, uh, white has played two moves, right? For He can just chop off the knight immediately, and white hasn't wasted any time. The only reason um, this move works, so to speak, is that it tempts white to get greedy. Whereas, if we were to look at this line, this is the Fritz variation, it's different. White has wasted time. He's moved his knife away, way over there. And so there's no knight to, um, to take him. And two, black has been able to play d5 in the meantime, uh, which is always a useful move, and it's giving him easy development for all his pieces. That's the idea. And then, of course, you could say sort of three, white still has all those tactical weaknesses in his position. Look, undefended, undefended, bishop, all that's undefended. So hopefully this trap doesn't come as any surprise. What happens if white gets greedy? Plays d6, trying to attack f7. Black doesn't care, black takes. All right, white cashes in. It's a fork. It doesn't matter if the queen's on d8 or d6, it's a fork. How do we take advantage of the tactical weaknesses? It's not queen goes to g5, it's rather queen to c6. Gets out of the fork, attacks the bishop, but more importantly, it's that g2 pawn way over there. And here, if you were to take, boom, and doesn't this look familiar? Check. It's the exact same sequence. So again, when I'm talking throughout this series about learning these ideas, learning these motifs, it's not just the focus on, okay, I'm going to memorize this one trap and hopefully win one game. It's like, no, we want these ideas um, to be internalized so that we can then apply them across different positions. If we know why something works, then we can use it. Whereas if we simply just memorize the moves, then you're just a trained monkey at that point. If it works, great, but otherwise, you, that's it. No, we wanna be able to get those ideas down. Why'd this work? Well, white got greedy, right? Why, how many moves did white play? White played, let's see, uh, knight g5, and then took this pawn, moved the pawn again to be able to take knights. He wasted about 18 moves trying to win an exchange. And in exchange, uh, black was able to just crush him. And I, what's really interesting about this is after queen goes to d6, it's almost too late for white to back out. Uh, in the other uh, videos I shared with the, um, the last video, bishop takes f7 was the better move, right? Because now the king is stuck over here. But let's keep going. White needs to be careful. h6 is coming. Um, we'll chase the knight away, and then that bishop's going to be lost. Bishop b3, most common move. All right, let's take it. Now let's push that knight away. Now let's play e4. 
What do you think about this position? What's your evaluation? Let me just delete some of these. If you're a computer, uh, you say the position's about even. Uh, white's up a pawn. But what else? What I see and what the stats show, let me show the stats. We can see here that black scores, um, well, 60%, even though he's down a pawn. Why is that? Well, again, um, especially if black is going to play something like knight g1 or this move. Knight goes to h4. After king goes to f7, let's look at this. Black has two bishops on a wide open board. The board is almost as open as it can get be. Those bishops are going to absolutely crush. Uh, this knight is in danger of being trapped, actually, after something like g5, which is always funny. Sure, it might look like black's king is in some danger. And certainly, it doesn't want to be on f7. It would rather be, you know, castled safely. But how can white get to it? Like, there's no queen goes to h5. Nope, absolutely taken. Uh, white has z literally zero development. White has no control of the center. Black has the center. Black is ahead in time. Again, black is starting to play g5. Black has two bishops. Black is doing fantastic. And it went to the point where in computer speak, go up two moves, this position is roughly equal. Uh, this position is now much worse for white. And again, the stats um, show that clearly. And the reason for this, again, is white has been so focused on winning material that he's been stuck with a pretty crappy position. And sure, black's down a pawn, but he's got such easy play in practice, especially online blitz. Uh, it's very hard for white. So I think we've established what white should not do. White should not be going all out just trying to win on f7. What should, what should white do? Again, let's think of those opening principles. We know we want to develop, we want to control the center, we want to castle. Of those three, uh, the center um, should be the primary focus. This is what GM, I always say his name wrong, Oleksienko uh, suggests. Always focus on the center. That should be your primary idea. Because if, if you control the center, good things tend to follow. C3. And fortunately, this is actually the most played move. And it makes a lot of sense, you know, if we just sort of back up. The knight jumped into d4. Let's push it back. Let's kick him away. And what's really funny is that the next two moves tend to be b5, hitting the bishop, and then bishop goes all the way back to f1. Now, to fully understand this, I'm going to back up and just briefly explore a different move right here. b5. Uh, this might be... One of my favorite, I'll just say it. This is probably my favorite variation in chess. And my all-time best game, my favorite game, came in this variation as black. Like, what the heck is going on? Why is black randomly playing b5? Uh, well, just a couple things. If take, take. All right. Uh, this is kind of funky, but black has the two bishops. This pawn is really easy to be taken. Uh, and black has more control of the center. Black is probably better. Let's look at the stats. Yep, black wins more than white. Okay, that's one idea. Let's back up. Okay, instead of taking the knight, let's take the pawn. Well, now we've got queen takes d5. Oh, look, those att those tactical weaknesses are coming in here. Bishop's attacked, pawn's attacked. Sure, you can do this. But look at this position. Black is ahead in development. Black, again, has two bishops on a wide open board. Those bishops are going to come to absolute prime diagonals um, if white castles he's toast but it's going to take white about eight years to try and castle queenside and if white does castle queenside look we've got open lines over here too what did the stats say stats say yeah white's doing pretty bad let's back up okay what if instead of taking we've got knight c3 where the knight defends the bishop this is better we've now got um, queen takes uh, g2, it's attacking this knight, it's attacking this rook, and there's only one move that saves white, uh, queen f3. And now if we just look at the most played moves, queen takes f3, knight takes f3, uh, our knight's attack, we're going to play bishop d7, d3, and now rook b8. Let's look at the stats. Black is doing better. Uh, and do we see why? In these positions, again, uh, black's got the bishops are controlled. 
attacking over here. Um, more control of the center. In this position, white has actually done better. And I believe if I turn on the computer, it's going to say the position is roughly equal. Actually, no. It says uh, black is just doing a little bit better. Uh, 0 0.3 for black. But, you know, whatever. Wide open lines. Everything is great. And so, what on earth does white do after this b5 move? Taking doesn't work. Um, the best move is bishop f1. This is the theory move. Oh, I should get rid of the stats so I don't spoil that. Oh, no. Bishop f1. Wow. So we're going to undevelop the bishop. And I think it's worth asking, first off, why? <laughs> well, the idea, it's actually, because now if we take with the queen d5, look, g2 is protected. Now knight c3 comes with tempo, and the queen just can't take on g2. Whoop, that doesn't work. After the queen moves somewhere, well, the knight and the bishop both now we can take the pawn we're not giving up the two bishops we're not losing a pawn on g2 uh, white's actually up a pawn in this position okay um that's the idea <laughs> it's uh, to take on b5 later if you will now i think it's perfectly justified to say hey smithy this is a whole series on opening principles why are you showing me a position where the best move is bishop f1? Like, how are the opening principles going to help me find that move? Excellent question. And the answer to that is, well, you're kind of out of luck. And I'm not just saying that. What I mean is, look, back here on move 4, you played knight g5. You're attacking instead of developing. You're trying to win material instead of castling or controlling the center or doing anything else. This is an unprincipled move from the opening principle standpoint. You can't then turn around and go two moves later, say, hey, how come the opening principles aren't working? If you um, aren't following the opening principles you know, earlier on, you can't then sort of get back on the train and try and follow them. Every time you're violating the principles, where you're moving pieces twice, where you're focusing on material instead of development, every time, um, that lessens how much you can rely on them going forward, right? To the point where now, in a position like this, to find the best move, again, the quote-unquote best move, uh, with bishop f1, you got to do some pretty hard calculation, or you need to study position in advance. And that's actually going to be my main takeaway for white, is that if you want to play any of these lines in early knight g5, all the power to you, you can do that. It might even be the best move. But it's not a principled move. You have to understand that you cannot just rely on opening principles going forward. Now let's look at this. Even though bishop f1 is the best move, and I mean that, I sh there's no air quotes there. It's literally the best move. Computer says that. Practice says that. Um, pure analysis shows that. I'm going to show you something that's not the best move. It's just an interesting move. It caught my eye. Bishop goes to g4. Most natural move, most played move is f3. Now look at this. We're going to play knight takes d5. So we're attacking this guy. Take, take. What do you think? What's your opinion of this position? What do you see? If you're a computer, what you see is bishop takes b5. You're up a pawn. And uh, apparently you're better. At least a little bit. Uh, you know, white's got an advantage. The normal opening advantage, so to speak. But look at it from Black's point of view. Black has three pieces to develop, and it's Black's turn to move. White has this huge weakness here, and this huge weakness on this diagonal. White's king um, is going to be taken for a ride in this position. The one saving grace, you could say, is that Black does not have the two bishops. White does. But Black um, has an enormous initiative for the single pawn. If I were to show you the stats... Yeah, it's all black. It's only been five games, but they've been five decisive games and where white goes down extraordinarily hard. And again, even though white has played the quote unquote best moves here, again, according to the computer, uh, at the end, he's gotten a very small advantage. And in practice, it's a very difficult position. Why? Because he doesn't have the center, he doesn't have development, and he doesn't have king safety. Uh, you basically need to be a computer to navigate um, the complications going forward. 
I might be overstating a little bit, but certainly black position is very easy to play. And in all these lines, even where the computer is saying that black's position um, isn't that great, or at least white's got a nominal advantage in computer speak, all those graphs I kept showing, black does so well. And why is that? It's because in these variations, white has the tactical weaknesses, white is playing unprincipled chess, and so it's white who has to try really, really hard to hold the balance. That's what I'm trying to share with all of these. Some of these may or may not be traps, so to speak, but they are um, really trying to highlight how not following the principles can lead you astray really, really quickly. So that's that. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening and all that. I'll just give a quick shout out to everyone. Apparently I have 500 subscribers. I don't know how that happened. So thank you for that. Um, Woohoo. Let's get like the next 500, you know, faster, or I don't know, whatever. <laughs> uh, that's great. Your support is absolutely wonderful. Other than that, comment, questions, leave all that. That's amazing. Check out my blog. It's smithyq.blogspot.com, or it, the link's in the description. Um, enough rambling from me. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take care. Bye for now.